There's no limit to the number of times you can half a number. But the same might not be true of space. The Planck length is thought to represent the minimum length for which the concept of length is even meaningful. Well, today I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to try a reaction video where I react to one of the Talking Heads videos that are popular on YouTube, such as this one by PBS Space Time. And I'll put in the link below and I'll use only about half the video. I already skipped over the introduction. And what I want to talk about is all the numerous mistakes that, that this person makes, um, which is actually fairly common in most of the physics videos um, from the mainstream talking heads who don't really study the physics. They just know what they're taught and they're taught wrong. And in this case, his first mistake is saying that space has dimensions because, and this is a problem that originated with Einstein, that, that Einstein said there's no medium of space, there's no ether, there's no quantum field. Space has no physical reality by itself, but somehow space has physical dimensions that you could draw dimensions dimensional lines and that somehow that's real when that's not real. You have to have a physical substance in order to have dimensions and physical substance in order to have clocks. And so just the idea that space itself is subdivided is totally wrong minded. The physical dimensions emerge from the quantum field and I'll talk about that. So let's go more into the video. Here, the illusion that space is smooth and continuous breaks down. But what happens when you go smaller? Does, does space break into discrete chunks? Does space even exist as we know it? Before we zoom in on space, let Yeah, so like I said, he doesn't even understand what space is. And so Pretty much the whole video is nonsense from this point forward. Let's zoom back in time to see where the idea of the Planck length even came from. In the final year of the 19th century, Max Planck ushered in the quantum age by thinking about hot pokers. He found the long sought mathematical description of black body or thermal radiation by requiring that the energy of light in this heat glow was not infinitely divisible. Rather, he found that it came in quanta discrete chunks of energy that we now call photons. Planck's discovery hinges on yeah, a single number cool. that appears in his equation, the Planck constant. It represents the chunkiness of thermal radiation. Multiply the frequency of light by this number and you get the energy of a single photon. Now here's where he's made a mistake that, well, he'll continue to make mistakes over. The frequency is continuous. The frequency is not chunky. So the energy is continuous, continuous. H just sets the conversion factor. Max Planck had introduced the whole quantized light thing as a mathematical trick. He expected the value of the Planck constant to be zero, which would mean that energy could be infinitely. It can't be zero because E equals HF. So if it were zero, regardless of the frequency, you'd have zero energy. And this is a problem that the Planck's constant does a whole lot more than establish the zero point energy of, of anything. You have more than just a zero point energy related to, but its energy conversion factor is one of the most important things that it is. Divided, but the constant remains stubbornly non-zero, zero even can't if be it's very, very divided. small. That simple fact revealed the fundamental blockiness of the subatomic world. We now see it everywhere in quantum mechanics. It's a fundamental constant of nature that defines the scale. What it defines is the conversion of frequency to energy. That's its most important role. Of the quantum. From the Planck constant comes the Planck length. It's the length you get when you combine the gravitational constant, the speed of light, and the Planck constant in just the right way to give units of length. The square root of g times h bar over c cubed, where h bar is the reduced Planck constant, the Planck constant divided by two pi. Okay, here he's made another big mistake. 
And this is the assumption that G is meaningful at the Planck scale. Because at the Planck scale, we don't have any physical bodies that gravitate. Quantum fluctuations are the only thing that exists at the Planck length, and quantum fluctuations don't participate in gravity. If they did, the gravitation would be infinite, and it's not. In fact, what happens is that the quantum field pushes on bodies in all directions simultaneously, and we only get motion when there's a differential in this pressure, and that's what causes acceleration. And so we, we don't have any bodies at the Planck length. The smallest objects that we've measured a physical radius of are protons at the charge radius, which is around 10 to the minus 15 meters, which is 20 orders of magnitude bigger than the Planck length. As you now know, the number comes out pretty small, around 10 to the power of minus 35 meters. But why is this random seeming combination of constants so important? Well, it represents the scale at which space itself so is thought to become quantum. Space I say is a thought because space we not to conduct experiments at that time the scale. Field so has to understand why physicists believe this length. And that's, as I said, the quantum field is made of quantum fluctuations. The quantum fluctuations have wavelengths and frequencies. The wavelengths give the quantum fluctuations physical spatial dimensions. And the frequencies in cycles per second give the quantum fluctuations a clock rate. And it's the quantum fluctuations, physical dimensions, and clock rates that give space its physical dimensions and clock rates. Space doesn't have them by themselves. Is so important, we'll have to do some experiments in our brains. Yeah. Not the point I want to focus on today is that through the uncertainty principle, we see that the Planck constant represents the limit to which we can measure the universe. Now, we recently talked about how, with a bit of clever physicsing, it's possible to stretch the uncertainty principle to the limit. For example, we should be able to measure location in space down to any conceivable precision, perhaps even infinite precision, as long as we're happy to have infinite uncertainty in momentum. But it turns out that the Planck constant defines a new source of quantum uncertainty that you can't ever physics away. No, that's not true. And we'll see why in just a minute why that's not true. And we hit that uncertainty at the Planck length. Let's continue our Gedanken experiment. Now adding two key ideas from Einstein. First, that mass and energy are equivalent as expressed by the most famous equation ever, E equals mc squared. And second, that mass well, and energy warp the fabric. Here's another one that I hate. The most famous equation ever. He keeps saying this in a lot of his videos. It's not, it's, it's not really that famous or it shouldn't be. It's, once again, it's for uneducated people. The e equals hf or e equals h nu, the Planck's relationship to the energy and frequency is much more important in my estimation than e equals mc squared. ...of space-time. So, back to Heisenberg's microscope. Let's say... And again, neither mass nor energy warp space-time because space, or space or time, because space doesn't have dimensions to warp in the first place. So they can't be warped by anything, and space doesn't have physical clocks, so those can't be changed either. We're trying to measure our distance with perfect precision, and who cares about momentum? We keep decreasing the wavelength of our measuring photon, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray, which also increases the photon's energy and momentum. As we crank up the energy even further, we start to notice something. The photon is starting to produce an observable gravitational field. Uh, no. And the reason why goes back to what is a photon? We know that photons are polarizable, and we know that photons make rotating electric and magnetic fields. For those three things to be true, a photon must be made of electric charge dipoles. And Louis de Broglie realized this in the 1930s, and he realized that that dipole would be a Dirac particle pair, like an electron-positron pair. And so that's when he first modeled it that way. 
But what he didn't realize at the time was that these were a massless quantum fluctuation. That is what these pairs are. And because they're quantum fluctuations and quantum fluctuations don't gravitate, photons don't have mass. They never did. It was all a big mistake on Einstein's part. Even though photons are massless, if enclosed in a system, a photon yeah, creates what we massless. call effective mass, according to Einstein's equation. They don't. The resulting gravitational field changes the distance to the object, adding a new uncertainty in distance. Okay, no distance one last dip into the no field. Space has no dimensions. There's no uncertainty related to non-existent dimensions. It's all nonsense. See how big this uncertainty is. Space is stretched by a factor equal to the effective mass times stretched. the gravitational constant divided by c squared. The effective mass is Let's zero, repeat. so delta x is zero. So it doesn't add anything to the error. It's the mass with the effective mass of our photon, its energy over c squared, and the energy of the photon is Planck's constant times c squared over the wavelength. Well, that part was true. But still, when you're dealing with the effective mass, and put that in the equation, you're talking nonsense. We have this thing that's full of our wonderful fundamental constant. Yeah, and now you put G back in there, and G doesn't make sense, because G is not a rational number at the Planck scale. It doesn't mean anything, because there's no object at the Planck scale that gravitates. In fact, in the exact form None as the Planck length squared divided by the wavelength. And this is where All I nonsense. hope it gets interesting. As you pump up the energy of the photon, reducing the wavelength also reduces the regular Heisenberg uncertainty. But at the same time, That's this true. new uncertainty increases. No. You're still winning the it's uncertainty game up to a point. When the wavelength of the photon reaches exactly the Planck length, these two uncertainty terms become the same, Nothing and happens. any further decrease in photon wavelength actually increases your measurement uncertainty due to the warping of space. So this is one way of thinking about it. The Planck length represents the best possible resolution that any distance can be measured. It'll yeah, once again, you make a wrong assumption about space having dimensions and wrong assumptions that photons have gravity and photons have mass and that the gravitational constant g is applicable at the Planck length range. And these are all wrong assumptions. So you end up getting a totally wrong result. Also represents the minimum size that you can meaningfully ascribe to anything. Okay, imagine now that you're trying to measure the distance across a one Planck length object. You need a photon with a wavelength smaller than one Planck length. Yes. But that photon has enough effective mass to produce a black hole with a Planck length event horizon. So any attempt to measure something that small swallows it in a black hole. Yeah, there's no black hole. You have to have an object with the ability to gravitate. You need to have gravity be effective at that scale. And those things are not true. You don't, photons don't have gravity. They don't have mass or effective mass. And there is no gravity at the Planck length scale to begin with because there's no objects with mass. If there somehow were an object with mass that size, then with that much energy, then yes, you, you could conceivably have a tiny black hole. But there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. Another way to think about that is that if you try to measure a size smaller than a Planck length, the warped geometry changes that size no. to give 100% uncertainty. This explains no. why the Planck length is this particular combination of fundamental constants. It's the wavelength Jeez, of a photon that creates a black hole of the same size, and so represents the fundamental limit of the measurability of space. I'll, I'll stop here because while he goes on for another three or four minutes, it's just more nonsense. And there's not much point. He just gets increasingly crazy even talking about space having wormholes. And so I, I wanted to give this as an example because when I watched this, I realized that even for him, this was particularly bad and that 
people should know about it. People should be aware. And so I hope to do more of these, uh, but let me know if you like this format. I still want to do a separate video on why the Planck length is based on bad assumptions and talk about it technically. But it's kind of interesting to have this fake debate with uh, a talking head pseudophysicist like this to illustrate the problems. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, please like, share it with your physicist friends, and subscribe for my next ones. And I will be certainly doing more of these types of videos one way or the other, because I, I think it's a good way to get the message across. And I also have books for sale. As I always say, I've got my quantum field theory books where I talk about these problems and my particle theory books as well. And if you buy one of my books, that helps support my research, research as an independent researcher. And I, it allows me to publish papers and write my next books. So thanks for supporting my research if you help. And by buying one of my books, I hope you learn more about it. But in any case, keep watching my videos, and I'll make sure you learn more about it that way. So thanks again.